everybody. My name is John DePietro. And I'm Bob Zagami, and welcome to the Camper Report Show. Bob, we've got all the news of the day in the RV world, and who will you be talking to? Scott Tuttle from Intech RV, a small independent RV manufacturer that's getting a lot of headlines these days. And I'm going to be talking with a brand new full-time RVer who sold everything, bought an RV, and is hitting the road. Those are the stories that we're going to be talking about today on The Camper Report Show. Stay with us, everybody. Hey, everybody, it's John DePietro, and I want to take just a moment to wish you and your family the best holiday season ever from all of us here at The Camper Report Show. And welcome back to The Camper Report Show. My name is John DePietro, along with Bob Zagami. And Bob, there is so much news going on in the industry, and I understand that you listened in on a conversation with three of the big leaders of the RV industry. Yeah, friends at uh, RV Business did a great interview this morning with uh, Pete Legal from Forest River, Bob Martin from Thor, and Mike Happy from Winnebago. And good insight on what took place in 2020 and what they hope for in 2021. Bob, that is like getting Ford and General Motors together in the same room. The big three are all together, and uh, our friend Sherm and Rick Kessler uh, <laughs> talk about what they talked about. So, you know, it's, it's interesting because those three companies employ almost, actually over 40,000 people, and they are three of the largest in the industry. So you're right, it, it would be the equivalent of wow. uh, some business analysts getting, getting the big two uh, automobile manufacturers there. But Sherman Rick always do a great job on these. And, you know, it's one of the things that we try to do on the Camper Report show is we take the industry news and we consumerize it. So there are a lot of things that happen in the trade press, such as this interview today. But Bob, we, I, think you, I think you just made up a new word. We consumerize it. I, yeah, I think so. It'll be Webster's uh, word of the year. You so I'll def- I'm going to try to define it. Tell me if I'm okay. Basically, what you did was listen to three people talk shop and have translated into, you know, the regular normal RV or like – so many of our viewers and how this impacts them. Would that be a, f- a fair assumption of what to say you did? That's a, that's a real good assumption because we want them to understand the business end of the RV industry, but from a consumer sp- perspective. Yeah. And one of, the first, one of the first things they talked about was the accelerated expectations of the new buyers. They, they fully understand and grasp the importance of the new buyers in the industry and what they, what they are going to expect in terms of quality, responsiveness, and certainly on the repair side of it. And, and how will, what, what is their plan to uh, meet those expectations? Well, there's a program in the industry called RECT, R-E-C-T, for Repair Event Cycle Time, and that engages the manufacturers, the suppliers, and the dealers on measuring their performance from the time that a customer brings a unit in for repair until the time they pick it up. And obviously, there's several factors that go into that. There's the warranty aspect, identifying warranty items. There's the availability of getting parts. There's having the right technician available to fix the right problem. So a lot of components that go into it and it's being software driven by a lot of the companies that the software uh, that is used for the dealer process. Mm -hmm. Uh, That was, that was a big aspect of it also. There's nothing more disheartening for an RVer to bring their unit in what they think is for major, for minor service at a dealership in uh, June, July or August and be told that it'll be a month before you can even get a part for it. That is just disheartening, right? Right. And, and the, you know, the supply chain is coming around. That was a big topic. The supply chain is getting better. The parts are getting to the manufacturers. We don't have as many units waiting out in Elkhart for a particular component before they get shipped to the dealers. So they, are, they, they all felt that their deliveries to the dealers were picking up and getting better. So the inventories will start to build up at the dealers uh, themselves. And again, Everything happens on the dealer level, but it's always good to hear from the manufacturers because manufacturers in most cases don't sell, don't sell direct, and they do have to serve the public through the dealership network that they've all set up. And um, I think you had a figure before that you mentioned a while ago. Between those three companies, what percentage of the domestic RV 
market do they hold? About 84%. So they, there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of RV brands under those three names. Let me tell you. But you know, one of, one of the other things that they mentioned, which I thought was very interesting, they recognize the importance of peer-to-peer networks, such as RV Share, Outdoorsy, RVZ. They recognize that these networks are bringing people into the industry. They're giving people an opportunity to see what RVing is all about at different levels, and they're going to become RV consumers in the future. That, that was nice that they recognized that. Well, that's interesting that they saw that because, you know, like a, a dealer that we know in Massachusetts uh, has always been their, so their rental dealer only, um, has been try it before you buy it. And what's happening is people who could not buy an RV last year ended up renting, and so many of those rental customers are turning into owners and uh, you know what a great way to uh, bring people into the business that have already had a sampling of what RV life is all about. Yep and and both Pete Legal and Bob Martin address this whole issue of people working from their RVs that the industry really has not yet recorded or analyzed the number of people who are buying RVs now that are really work related not not even recreational purposes, but they mentioned that large corporations are closing office towers, the the number of people that are working from home. And of course, once somebody gets into working from home, then they can work in an RV because they've got the same situation and the homeschooling. So they're going to take a closer look at that in 2021 to see what percentage of the marketplace is gravitating towards that. Well, it's interesting you mentioned that because one of the features that I'll be dealing with today is a person who has uh, spent many years in the corporate world and decided, you know what, this isn't fun anymore, sold her house, bought an RV, and um, in a couple of weeks is hitting the road to make a living by being a photographer. So there's uh, a person who was formerly one of those office dwellers and is now going to be, uh, you know, we'll see her on the campgrounds of America. The other interesting thing about the campgrounds of America is that, and that's not KOA, that's COA, the campgrounds within America, uh, is that the states of Arizona and Florida are going to be impacted by the lack of snowbirds. And I didn't realize it, but snowbird really refers to Canadians that do, um, you know, head south for four months to get rid of those, those cold, cold Canadian winters. And the studies are showing that uh, there's going to be a hit that's taken unless something happens real soon. Right now, the U.S. border and the Canadian border for RV traffic is closed at least till December 21. And all indicators are that uh, that ban is going to continue. Well, you know, what's interesting about that is did they give specifics? Because there's a very good, isn't there, very, isn't there a very good chance that those empty lots will be taken by new snowbirds who are buying RVs. So we got all these new people. They, they may think they hit pay dirt in being able to get a site that, that's been very rare the last few years. And this report also said that a lot of the RV spaces that the Canadians usually took over for four months, you know, January, February, March, April, or December through March, uh, are now being utilized by weekenders that live in Florida, that want to, um, you know, they're, they're, they're full-time Florida residents that are now getting into RVing. It's very, de- um, uh, not deceptive, but very perceptive that you, that you pick that up. The other interesting thing that I found out is that um, if Canadians want to come to the U.S. this year because of the um, COVID situation down here, they're paying a $1,800 to $3,000 increase in the premiums on their health insurance because they're away from Canada and they're going into an area that is quote unquote more of a danger zone than Canada. So they're being whacked with these giant surcharges on their health insurance. And some people quite frankly can't afford it. So they're staying home for that reason. But that's a pretty hefty charge on top of everything else that they would be, um, you know, incurring just to make, to make that kind of a trip. Well, you know, the thing is, um, Florida expects 3.6 million 
Canadians every summer that have an economic impact of over a billion dollars on the Florida economy. And uh, that money may not be made up internally, uh, the campground sites may be, and uh, the numbers in Arizona, the two big states where the, the snowbirds hit, uh, are down considerably. But there are some other states in the South that are making up those lost Canadian spaces with domestic travel. So that's interesting to see as well. Well, you know, uh, going back to the three big three there for a minute, uh, all three of them felt that we would be seeing tremendous activity in 2021. They, they agree with all the forecasts that uh, 2021 will also be a, a good year and, and probably for the next two or three years. But Rick Kessler from RV Business added to that, and he noted that a lot of this new business is being driven by the increased awareness of the outdoor recreation mm -hmm. activity. So we have the outdoor recreation roundtable. We've talked about it before that yep. encompasses boats and RVs and uh, motocross and ATVs and hiking and fishing. And and Rick feels that 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 is going to create a 10 year run on record RV sales, RV sales and boat sales. Mm -hmm. As more and more people get outdoors, they're, they're recognizing and, and the COVID crisis helped that. They, they're recognizing they wanna be with their families, they wanna be outdoors, they wanna be in safe environments. That's where they do it. And so, so they're adding, you know, Rick saying, we got another 10 year run coming up on this. Well, and you know, the amazing thing is it's, it's proven, regardless of what the weather is and regardless of what the circumstances are around it, people are not gonna give up their vacation. They have to take a vacation, especially the way the situation is in the US where people work 50 weeks a year in order to take two weeks off. They're finding that vacations are healthful, not helpful, but healthful. And um, you know what? They've rediscovered their families at the same time. So you can look at the COVID thing as all negative, or you can look at it from a positive perspective and see all the good things that have happened because of it. Well, you know, I, I, that's funny you say that. I was talking to somebody this week that felt that being able to work at home and being more productive, and, and let's face it, when they work at home, they work more hours. Oh. They, the time they're not commuting. So they actually felt that they, they felt better about their weekends and not working on the weekends because they were putting in so many hours during the week and they could go camping more and they could go outdoors with their family. So yeah, there, there are some benefits to this thing. They realize that, hey, maybe I, maybe I don't have to work six or seven days a week and neglect my family and, and not take a vacation. But you know what? You put that extra hour, hour and a half in in the morning and you work till 5.30 at night where normally after five, you know, 4.30, 5 o'clock, you start saying, eh, I gotta get out of here because I gotta have to deal with, you know, an hour to two in traffic depending upon where you live. Um, oh. That's now productive time. And again, those weekends are even more valuable than they were before. So yep. with that being said, that's a wrap on the news section of our show. Stay with us. We've got two more great segments coming up. Hey, everybody. If there's a topic that you'd like to see us cover on the show, please put a comment below. And now back to our show. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another segment of the Camper Report Show. My name is John DiPietro. And as I've said over and over and over again, you meet the nicest people who are RVing, whether it's on a campground, whether it is at a state park, whether it is at a um, roadside rest area, and uh, also on the internet. And one of the nice people that we're gonna have an opportunity to talk with today, her name is Joy Newcomb. She joins us from the Buckeye State, but she's gonna talk about her life in LA and her trip across the country and uh, she is a photographer, has a long history as a photojournalist for major newspaper groups, and uh, has decided to um, say bye-bye to the corporate life and hello to a life of RV. Joy, welcome to our show. Thank you, thank you very much. You have a very interesting background, and um, I should say that I bumped into your background by reading a comment on Facebook that I think was the RV Entrepreneur Group, yeah. that our friend Heath, friends Heath and Alyssa run. And uh, you were looking for suggestions about a new logo. And uh, then I read a little bit further and saw that um, your background is interesting. And, and tell us a little bit about 
where you're from, what you've been doing, and what your plan is for the future. It's a pretty big story. So where I'm from, actually, <laughs> I uh, originally am from Ohio, and I worked for a few, quite a few newspapers here in the Ohio area. I uh, actually worked for a newspaper in Idaho for a short period of time. And uh, when I came, when I came back to Ohio and worked for the newspaper here, I kind of got tired of that, got burnt out from that industry and decided to pack up everything, not have a job and moved to Los Angeles on a whim. Not really on a whim, kind of on a whim. Uh, followed some friends. Semi-whim. Kind, of, kind of a whim. <laughs> but did, I didn't have a job and took a chance and moved to Los Angeles and ended up living there for 15 years. Kind of worked in the photo industry for a while. I became a graphic designer for a little bit, but ended up working for a pretty major camera company out there, Sammy's Camera, and uh, managed the eBay department they had out there. And I was driving home one day from work and my friend, uh, one, of my, one of my good friends to ask me where I wanted to live, where I wanted to settle down because I knew Los Angeles wasn't gonna kind of be my forever home. It was, it was crowded and I was really tired of the two hour, 19 mile drive home from work. People don't understand, but uh, traffic starts at, at uh, four in the morning and probably never lets up until two in the morning. Stop. Yeah, exactly, it's, it's, right. it's, it's a constant battle of traffic. So I, I was burnt out from that. And I came across, he asked me that question. He asked me, where do you want to live? And I, I, I really didn't have an answer. And In other words, what do you want to do when you grow up, Joy? Exactly, exactly. Uh, my problem is I like to move around a lot. And Los Angeles was honestly the longest I had really lived anywhere. You know, I lived in Coeur d'Alene. I lived in Ohio, moved around Ohio quite a bit. Lived in Jersey for a short while. and. Uh, I got on Pinterest that, that night, you know, that, that his, his question got my wheels turning and I got on Pinterest that night and came across Alyssa's book on how to live in an RV. And I, I kind of had that, that aha moment. Mm -hmm. Like, why, why didn't I think of this? Why didn't this even dawn on me that this is something that I could do? So I spent two years doing research and getting ready and left my life in Los Angeles and traveled across country. And uh, during that time, did you do your renovation in L.A. or did you do your renovation out here in Ohio? <laughs> no, Los, you, unless you own a home, you don't really have a place to do right. renovations. Okay. <laughs> and I lived in a, you know, I lived in a pretty cool apartment in L.A., but there was there was no room to, to do to do renovations. So I ended up driving home, driving home, which for me is Ohio because most of my family is here. Yeah. And uh, my brother my brother volunteered to help. <laughs> and uh, so he and I worked on the, the renovations after I got back to Ohio. Hmm. Yeah. You, you were kind enough to send us a lot of pictures and we're gonna, we're gonna post them here as we speak. But um, you really took on a task. I mean, you got rid of the wallpaper and you painted everything. Actually, you're in that RV right now. Can you just yeah. turn that camera around a little bit without it's, too much? There's the, the kitchen. There's the kitchen, kind of, okay. Yeah, it can't, it's dark oh, in here. With the backsplash. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. Now that's the second backsplash. I originally put on um, some backsplash I thought was kind of nice in Los Angeles because the first thing I did was paint the walls because the walls were just ugly. <laughs> and I, I don't, I mean, it was 2007. I don't know why Winnebago thought that that was a really nice look, <laughs> but I, that's the one thing I knew I could do right away. So I painted the walls and I put on a black backsplash in the, the kitchen. And, uh, I ended up changing it to now the black one, which I absolutely love, and I'm probably never going to change that. Black and white are big colors now, huh? Yeah. Well, and as a photographer, I love. I oh, a that's right. That's so right. black and white is my favorite. I mean, I have. Let's see. I don't know if you can see it. Where is it? Right there is a. Uh, right there is an Ansel Adams print. <laughs> okay. Now I also noticed that. Um, not many RVs come equipped with what you have, Joy. Is that you actually have a dark room? Right in your RV? Not really. <laughs> it's actually my bathroom. <laughs> I stole that sign. I but stole that sign from the paper I used to work for. <laughs> so you show signs of age when you when you were working with uh, when you had to take film into the dark and do all the developing of it. Yes. Where today it's it's somewhat cheating. When yeah. you take a picture and you look at it automatically and etc. But it seems as though your lifestyle so far has really been 
made for an RVer. And now with the new technology that's out there, and I know that you're still, you're still trying to discover what is it that you want to do, mm -hmm. but at least the photography part, you can yeah. do from anywhere. You can sell to anyone. And yeah. the fact that you will be nomadic in the best sense of the word gives you the capability to follow the sun and, um, um, you know, perhaps embark on this career for an extended period of time. Yeah, that's my hope. That is definitely my hope. As far as the photography goes, yeah, it's, it's been a dream since I was 12 years old to, to travel. And uh, my grandparents took me across country in a pop-up camper, and I fell in love at that point. And, and you never, although you never acted on it for a long time, it was always in the back of your mind. Huh? Very, very back of my mind. <laughs> yeah. But not forgotten. Not forgotten. No, no. It was definitely a highlighted memory in my life. And you wonder now with this pandemic situation that we're in right now with all of the families that have been able to hit the road with their kids because, you know, the learning is virtual and they can be in, you know, in the Buckeye state or in the, in the sunshine state yeah. and, um, and still be in class. You wonder how many kids, um, you know, 15 to 20 years from now will go jumping into RVing because they had such a great time. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean... It's a huge memory for both, for every, all the kids in our family. My grandparents chose to take each one of us across country for three weeks as soon as we hit a certain age. I was the oldest, so I was first. My brother has fond memories of doing it. And my goal, because I have five nephews, is to kind of do the same thing with them. Take them on their own trips mm. across what, country. What would, you, what would your message be to, um, to women that um, have the dogs with them and the cat? What do you have, two dogs and a cat? Two dogs and a cat, yeah. And, and no attachments um, about hitting the road. Um, has your gender played into your mind? Is that, oh, I don't know if I could do it because I'm a girl type thing? No, never. It was, it's one of those things that I grew up with my parents that taught me, basically, I can do anything I want to. You know, I worked in, a, I worked in the newspaper industry, which was a highly male-dominated industry. Especially the photo. So I learned, exactly. And I learned to get over that struggle. I learned to get past that. And, you know, I had a lot of friends that were like, well, you're going to be by yourself. And aren't you scared? And no, because you have internet now. I mean, I traveled across the country when I didn't have a cell phone. I had a pager. A so, pager. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's something that now you show a young kid a pager. And they will, what, what is that? You know? <laughs> exactly. 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 <laughs> so there's a group that we, we will post this on a group called Girl Camper. You should look up their uh, Facebook. I'm a member. Girl Camper. And we know Janine Pettit very well. We've had her on this show, in fact, uh, in several shows. And there are women that are really grabbing independence by the neck and, um, you know, taking, taking to the road. Yeah. And some of them are doing, I think, are even more adventurous um, than a motorhome. They're... They're towing theirs. And I'll tell you, I can't back up. So I don't like, to, I don't want to tow anything. Because if <laughs> I want to pull into a gas station, I'm going to go in and out and not have to worry about backing up and, and that other stuff. But um, um, what are some of the ways that you've looked at for um, revenue generation? I know that you said you're, you're kind of a research person. What, what is Yeah, right now. Uh, well, I've got, I, I am selling my photography on a website called Fine Art. Um, Fine Art of America. I do have a website there. I also have my own website. I have an Etsy store where I create printables that are all based around travel. And this way, it's not something I have to have in stock. It's mm -hmm. something that somebody can buy and just print out automatically. Kind of a, I don't like to call it, I don't like to call, what do they call that? Uh, passive income. I don't like to call it that because I'm always working on it. So it's yeah. not passive to me. Right. It's always working. creative. Yeah. So um, we will put down your websites and your, uh, your Instagram and all the other stuff down in the show notes down below. And uh, I've noticed that in the photography that I've seen of yours, do you consider that a gift? To have an uh, eye for an yeah, eye that's yeah. different than... I mean, I think, I think anybody that can write has a gift. I think anybody that can take a photograph has a gift. Anybody that can paint. So... I've been told that I have, I have an eye that most people don't see what I see when I'm taking photographs. You know, a lot of people take snaps. I tend to try to find unique angles 
at looking at something, you know, so it has to be some sort of a gift or else I don't, I don't know. <laughs> it's gotta be a gift in some way. Yeah. And one thing I noticed because my ADD kicks in, even when I've, you're the only one up on the screen, but I see behind you on your dark room door, a map of the United States. Yes. Have you, have you applied any magic marker to that? When well, the it's, roots are concerned? it's actually a map of the national parks. Oh. It's a map of the national parks and basically it's a scratch off now. So as I hit each national park, I scratch them off. And I've only done two so far because the pandemic happened and yep. now I'm parked in a drywall. Yep. Any questions that you want to ask our viewers that are watching this that may be able to write into you that um, you may have of them? Because again, through RV Life, we do reach over a million people. So um, here's your chance to get free advice. I guess the best, the best question, what is the best question? How did, how did any other photographer make it? I mean, it's, it's kind of an open-ended question because everybody has a different idea of what kind of photography they want to do. But, uh, you know, I guess the, the challenge is when it becomes, the challenge is when it comes to being a photographer and trying to succeed in a mobile lifestyle. I mean, I know there's wedding photographers that travel. I, I know that there's adventure photographers that do RV life. And, you know, so it's a matter of just finding my niche, I guess. Oh, you could always have a police scanner with you and go chase accidents. <laughs> I did that when I was in the newspaper. I'm not a fan. <laughs> accidents, murders, uh, train, <laughs> train derailments and that type of thing. But, uh, I'm sure with the national parks, with your creativity, you'll be able to find angles that um, no one else has yet seen. And uh, yeah. I want to wish you the best. Thank and you. her name is Joy Newcomb. And um, her contact information is down below and uh, we want to wish you the best as you begin your travels Thank and you. Uh, would you be kind enough to stay in touch with us throughout uh, the next few months let us know where you go and then we can of course once in a while do um uh what do you call it updates and yes yes travels of, well you got a name for uh, what's the name for your oh my my well my travel business aspect is called uh, AYJ Adventures and it's basically Awaken Your Joy. I came up with the idea that everybody's got to find something that awakens their happiness, their joy, the thing that they love and are passionate about in life. Yep. Awaken Your Joy. And I, the sad thing is because people are involved in this thing called making a living, their joy <laughs> has been suppressed and oh, yeah. at least put on the back burner until something something happens and that was when that gentleman asked you hey what do you want to do uh, where do you want to live and look at the way the uh, the creativity yeah. creativity started in you and uh, now it's right to i mean you're almost in the driver's seat ready to turn that ignition with, uh, with your dogs and cat yeah exactly no i i've enjoyed the trips that i took so far and you know when i left la i actually traveled from california following route 66 almost to chicago and then kind of veered, veered right and went to Ohio. Great. Hey, we want to wish you the best. Her name is Joy Newcomb. I'm John DePietro. This is the Camper Report Show. Stay with us. We'll be back with more right after this. All right. Welcome back, everybody, to the Camper Report Show. And I am delighted to have Scott Tuttle as our guest today. And Scott is with Intech RV and has quite a background in the business. So, Scott, give us a little... Uh, background for those folks that may not know your illustrious history in the RV industry. Hmm. I don't know if I call it illustrious as much <laughs> as maybe uh, fortunate being in, being able to work with some really good people at, at good times, but um, uh, came up in the industry here in Elkhart County uh, working for Fairmont Gulfstream uh, for a little more than 10 years. And then a couple friends of mine, Tim Hoffman, Doug Lance, John Reimer, we, just started to, we decided to start our own RV company and that uh, became Heartland Recreational Vehicles. That was in 2003. Five years later, you know, we were a $325 million company with 1,300 employees and it was, it was crazy riding that rocket ship. Um, I tried to settle down in 2008 and uh, left Heartland and started a little company called Living Light RV in uh, Wakarusa, my hometown. And uh, lo and behold, when the, you know, uh, basically the industry came to a standstill 2008, 2009, and this little company, Living Light RV, was in the right place at the right time 
building small campers for fuel efficient vehicles. And uh, we just exploded and uh, fast forward there. And five years later, um, you know, Thor uh, partnered with us to, to take the next step because it was becoming bigger than something that I was gonna be able to handle on my own. Um, and I'm gonna say, I think about 2016, I invested in this company in Napanee, Indiana called Intech. And at the time, Intech made only high-end racing trailers, but their quality level was just amazing. And I got involved with those guys and one thing led to another and we started building campers. And uh, now here we are, 2020, and it's it's fun. We're, we're building some really fun campers at Intech. Well, you know, it's, it's great when you're an independent small company and you can put the attention to detail that you have, because I know when we look nationwide, you don't have a lot of dealers, uh, but you've got some incredible dealers that manage to sell out all your stock every time, every time you yeah. make something. But both in Live and Light and Intech, you've got an aluminum framed trailer. You've got right. great designs. Why is that so important? And yeah, it might cost a little bit more, but I think the dealers that do well for you know how to sell value. They do. Um, you're right. What we build at Intech is, is something that takes longer to do. Uh, it's more labor intensive, but it's worth it. Uh, you know, building an all aluminum cage construction, you know, what are we eliminating there? We're eliminating a lot of steel and steel rusts. It just does. Um, and we're, we're getting rid of a lot of wood that's used commonly in, in roofs and sidewalls and such. And, and wood can rot. So we're building, you know, something that's, that's going to last longer. And plus it's lighter weight. Um, so we have lightweight products that can be towed with, with smaller vehicles. So that opens us, opens us up uh, to a new class of campers and a lot of first time buyers too. They don't want to go out and buy a big truck. So we have a lot of things they can tow with their car and their small SUVs. Well, you know, uh, with that in mind, there was a logical progression. When I look at your product line and I've watched you over the years, there was a logical progression in your product development, starting with the flyer. So give us a little kind of a, a roadmap of where you went from the, the flyer to something really special that you're just bringing out. Okay. Yeah, it is kind of a big jump, really. So the first product that we brought out was the flyer. And, you know, it was just a tiny box uh, for people that were that just wanted to get off the ground. You know, we, we, uh, we have a slide out kitchen on it and you can attach a tent to the back of it. But inside there's really only room for a bed and, and a lot of storage. Um, but it's a very bare bone basic camping unit. And uh, what's funny is the first year, it really took a while for it to catch on because the dealers even looked at it and said, well, who's gonna want this? Well, what happened was after about a year, they started people coming into dealership that had never come in before. And we started to hit with a, a product in the right place at the right time, at the right price. And I gotta tell you right now, it's, it's still outsells everything that we have. Um, it, you know, it comes in a few more sizes, but not a lot more amenities. Um, the basic flyers is really only about eight feet long. And we came out with one that was maybe about 10 feet long. And now we have one with some tip out bunks. And um, we finally did one just this year that has a bathroom in it. And again, it's always listening to the customers and what, what that's driving instead of listening to, you know, just what corporate America thinks and wants. It's, it's been the, it, it really has been the, the blueprint for what we do at Intech. You know, what, what are the customers asking for? Well, you know, I love the philosophy of that because we all, in the industry, we love to talk about all the great things that we do and how wonderful the lifestyle is and how many units we sell. But the fact of the matter is the audience for that, you said that it's really the camper that's sleeping on the ground. And there's, by anybody's estimate, there's about 30 million of those. So I don't think you're going to run out of prospects anytime soon. But right. you've given them a platform and an introduction to the company. And then you just took that and started to build out your product line. So tell us what happened after that. Well, 
you know, we started working on something with a little more flair and a little more design to it again, because we'd run into customers that said the, the, the gentleman would say, I love this, but my wife hates it. You know, it's too rugged and we need to soften it up a little bit. So we started working on the Luna and it is so funny because, you know, one day one of my partners had a sketch on his wall and I said, what is that? And he goes, it's an idea I have where instead of the, you know, the front of the camper leaning back, I leaned it forward. And I thought, and he wanted to dismiss his own idea and said, well, let's think about this and think about that. And I go, no, wait a minute, you've got something there. Let's look at this. And, and that was the, the beginning of our tilt forward design that's become now a trademark at Intech. And it really uh, amplifies the, the interior living space in the coach. Um, and we got into, uh, on purpose, we decided to get into the teardrop market. But as you know, most teardrops are, are, are kind of, you know, rounded and, and there was really not a lot of room in there except for maybe to sleep. And for big guys, they had to sleep kind of in the fetal position. So we took uh, the teardrop market and we introduced the Luna and we called it a modified teardrop. It was much bigger footprint inside you could actually uh, not only sleep in it, but we did uh, beds that were chairs so you could sit in it. We put seating up front uh, where there was a wraparound panoramic windshield. And then we, we spent time designing everything inside to have a little bit classier look and feel to it. And on top of that, we redesigned what was known as the teardrop kitchen, you know, what was acceptable in kitchens for teardrops. And we brought a real RV kitchen into the back of this uh, Luna camper. And it was awesome to see the response. Um, it, was, it was one of those products that, uh, you know, consumers and dealers alike took to right away. It was very unique looking. And it just kind of started to change the teardrop market and what people could expect out of a teardrop. Okay, so then we fast forward to 2021. And you got some product coming off the uh, assembly line pretty quickly here. Uh, I think it's going to be another major innovation and, and accepted very well by the camping community. So tell us what your latest and greatest is. There's one step in between there. And that was we had people that loved the Luna, but they wanted more space and they, and they wanted a bathroom and, and you know, a, a separate sleeping area. So we came out with the soul. Uh, in 2000, late 18 and early 19. So the soul has been just a huge hit for us as a company. Um, it was a second finalist back-to-back -back years for product of the year. But it, even with the success of soul, people told us that they wanted a separate private bedroom with a walk around bed and a dry bath with a separate shower. And to do that, we needed a bigger footprint. So we, we, are, uh, we just launched the Terra, which is our first wide body, eight foot wide coach. And it's a 26 foot box. And again, it has that tilt forward design where we're increasing the interior living space. And it has that huge panoramic wraparound windshield. It's exciting. I was, I was talking to the guys yesterday. Um, we have about 80, just a little over 80 dealer locations throughout the United States. And looking at production in 2021, um, we've only got enough to give every dealer three Terras. And many of our dealers have already sold out the three. And we've got retail customers that are calling around to dealers and they're saying, have you sold your spring Terra and your summer Terra? I'll take your fall Terra. It's kind of fun. <laughs> that's, that's an amazing story, but uh, that's what happens when you build a good reputation and people are, are willing to wait for whatever's going to come off the line and, and when it comes off the line. But I think you've done this over a number of years, and, and I think if you capsulize it, and we've got a couple of minutes left here, um, you've really built all your companies on quality, quality materials, quality construction. And it always amazes me when we sell a lot of things in this industry that cost some money, but uh, haven't been built with quality. And people, you know, dealers will say, well, this is what the customer buys. So this is what I sell. And I'm, I'm of the other generation. I'm of the generation that says, if you build quality and value, people will come and, and they will wait for it. And you've proven that time and time again. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's an age old 
uh, concept and philosophy, but it, it's true. It's always been true. And um, that's, I, I tell people that, that know me and emails that don't know me, if I'm going to be a part of something and my name's going to be associated with it, I want it to be associated with quality, not some customers calling us up and saying, hey, your product stinks. You know, I've been in this too long. I want nothing to do with that. I never wanted anything to do with that. So um, the people that work for us are, are special people. They understand uh, that it's about quality. They understand that they're all bought in. Every employee at Intech participates in profit sharing in the company, which means they understand if there's ever a warranty issue, it goes against not only what we stand for, but it goes against their paycheck. Um, and we are, to this day, the only factory that I know of in the RV industry and in many industries that does not have a time clock. We don't have a time clock in any of our buildings because we don't need it. Our guys know each other, trust each other, and they're all there. And if they weren't, they'd be gone. So they're all, they're all part of the team. Yeah. Uh, it's a fantastic story, Scott. We were talking the other day. I remember the first time that I met you was in Louisville, Kentucky at the annual national show and you were just starting living light and you couldn't get a space inside the show. So you you took a hotel across the parking lot and put your unit on the sidewalk and you were busy for three full days and, and that's where you launched Living Light. So uh, yeah. it's been a pleasure knowing you through the years and I certainly appreciate you coming on the Camper Report show today and we look forward to continued success for your company. All right, thank you very much. All right. Thank you for joining us in the show this week. And if you like this show, hit that subscribe button down below, down in the bottom right hand corner of your screen, there's a little button that says subscribe. And then when that is done, there's a little bell that pops up. Hit the bell so that every time we have a new show, you'll be the first to see it. And tell all your friends about it.